This is Life Rewired, the Brain Injury Podcast, for survivors, by survivors. And now your host, Rob and Ashley. Hi, I'm Rob, and this is Life Rewired. Ashley wanted to be here today so bad, but she had some issues come up, so she will not be here today. I send you my best, Ashley. Today joining me is Cameron Fatauer. Did I pronounce the name right? Yes. Okay. I, I practiced and I never did get the chance to ask him before we started. So I'm so glad I got it right. So Cameron, I met him just by chance. Um, I spent a lot of time in um, support groups and I just happened to see, I thought it was a picture publication, like from a news article. And it said, um, Ohio native, uh, becomes an attorney or something, something to that effect. And I thought, well, that's really neat. So I, I sent him a message and I said, Hey, would you like to be on the podcast? And Cameron said, sure. Well, after we talked, I uh, got to looking at it just so I could do a little research for the program. And I said, wait a minute, all things started clicking and this guy is like really close to me. So we're, we're within throwing distance of each other. So right. Cameron, Thank you so much for responding to me, and thank you for being on the program today. Yeah, thank you, Rob. Uh, it's a great opportunity to help the TBI community. Yes. Now, what I love about you, Cameron, is that you um, took the time to sit down and write a book. And it, the book is called Saving the Subject, How I Found You When I Lost Me. When I Almost Lost Me. Almost Lost Me. Sorry. And I, uh, when I started reading the book, I thought, well, it's the, I didn't understand the saving the subject. Well, then I, it, you do such a great job explaining everything and laying everything out. And the, the thing that you're going to love about this book is you can literally start on any chapter of this book and not having to have read before or after. So Cameron, tell me, I know you just celebrated or you didn't celebrate, you just had your nine year brain anniversary. So if you would, would you please share with our listeners, first of all, how you got your TBI? Yeah, of course. Thanks again, Rob, for having me on the show. Yeah. So not about nine years ago, September 18th, 2015, I was hit by a car as a pedestrian. I was on a skateboard, technically a longboard outside my parents' home in Columbus, Indiana, when I was struck by a speeding vehicle, immediately entered into a coma, lifeline via helicopter from Columbus, Indiana to IU Methodist Hospital, where I remained in a non-induced coma for two and a half weeks, and where the doctors diagnosed me with a severe diffuse axonal brain injury down to my brain stem. When I woke up, I had to relearn just about everything. I compared it to an Etch-a-Sketch. I had my life planned out, I was really passionate about becoming a minister and I uh, was very sold out for that and having to relearn everything it's like and the nature of a diffuse injury is the shaking of, of the skull shaking of the brain and so it shook the canvas clean again and I had to start start sketching in a new vision for my life and the Lord uh, really is the one who started doing that for me and uh, as he's always doing and I Thankfully, my physical recovery, I worked very hard at it and it progressed rapidly. But as with all TBIs, the, the injury and the hard truth of the injury is that it's invisible. So there's an internal injury that people don't see. So regardless of how the external looks or how you might perform on the outside, there's definitely a, a darker side to the inside that's pretty common. And, and so I really found myself on another kind of planet, uh, another kind of world that I never felt like before the TBI with cognitive struggles and uh, predominantly the emotional toil and turmoil I felt within myself after the TBI. So I, so, so that's how I got my TBI. So it was very, I wasn't in a car. I was a pedestrian hit by a car. And so, yeah, I shattered the windshield of the Lexus and pieces on my skull were on the car and pavement and it was just very graphic and difficult 
And yeah, it's very, I'm very blessed to be able to share a remarkable journey I've been on. And I'm thankful for Rob for checking out the book that just came out a few weeks ago. And it's, it's gotten some good feedback. And it's great, Rob. Uh, and I connected online because it's, it, it's like hearing people's responses to the book is really cool, especially when it's someone I don't really know. Like Rob and I, we don't, this is our first time really interacting in this way. So having him read this, read the book and, and still have positive reactions to it that are fresh and new and unsolicited uh, is pretty cool. So I'm happy to yeah. engage. What I love about this book, Cameron, is that you have written it in a way that really demonstrates not only how it feels to be a brain injury survivor, but the loneliness that comes with it as well. And, you know, you go out into public and people see you and they're thinking, well, there's nothing wrong with this person. You know, with, if you have a broken arm, you've got a sling, right? We, we don't, we don't come equipped with slings. This is all total new uncharted territory for a brain injury survivor. Which is why we do this podcast, because we want people to know that they're not alone and there are support groups. And that's one thing that I, I totally wish that I would have done sooner. Um, it took me almost three years to get into a support group. That's the best thing that I ever did because you feel weak, I guess, for actually needing support. But once you get into it, you're realizing, gosh, people get me. And then you have something in common with everybody. And I've got more friends now than I ever have had in my life. I've never had more than two friends in my life. And I've got a list of people that I can, if, if I'm feeling down, I can say, Hey, so-and-so you got time to talk. And I've always got someone to listen to. Yeah, that's huge. So what clicked and said, you know what? I'm going to write this book. Well, kind of like with everything in my post TBI life it's kind of before, but I just kind of get struck with an idea and I just kind of get impassioned by it and just run with mm. it. So it was very, I've always been a very passionate person. So it's, that was very helpful for me in my recovery. So it was really just last June, when I was kind of struck with the idea to actually write the book, because there were, I mentioned in the book in chapter five, that people, when I shared my story years ago, people would say, oh, we should write a book or that, that make a great movie, things like that. And so I took the suggestion seriously, um, you know, four or five years ago and started trying to write a personal memoir and I didn't get very far and I, I wasn't really into it because I've always found the objective merits of my life immaterial and not really that um, inspiring. For other people they are, but for me at least, I've always been kind of motivated by what I'd say is the life behind my life, the, the force, uh, the, the greater power behind my life, which isn't me. Or uh, another way I put it is the magician behind the magic of my life, and I'm not him. So, so, what the book does is it you it's got plenty of practical and personal vulnerability in there and mm -hmm. experiences uh, ranging from marriage to fatherhood to traumatic brain injury recovery and medications doctor visit like just there's all sorts of practical earthly things in there but i'm using all of that to illustrate deeper existential um personal, uh, just metaphysical faith kind of questions that we all have about life and identity and what it means to be a yeah. human and, and finding an identity that nobody can take from me. And ultimately that's my identity in relation to God. That's awesome, Cameron. It's very deep. Did you have issues when you first um, started seeking treatment? Do you, did were the doctors listening to you with your symptoms? Because oftentimes you go to a neurologist or whatever, and they'll say uh, you're, you'll be fine in a few weeks or a few months. And 
just things don't get better. Yeah. Well, it depends on what we're talking about. Um, so the, obviously there's all sorts of issues that can arise from a TBI. So mm-hmm. we've got the cognitive functional issues. We've got, you know, the motor skills and then, and so for me, a lot of it was the emotional and mm-hmm. subtle depressive episodes I kept having. And I had them yeah. for several years consistently after the accident where I just was very, very dark and suicidal for like at least 60% of the days for several years or so three or four years consistently. Yeah. It was really, really difficult. And, and so I kept going to different doctors and trying to figure out what was, what could help antidepressants, you know, all that stuff you've probably experienced and other people, you know, probably tried those things and none of it would really solve the issues and it would maybe keep them at bay for a little bit, but yeah, ultimately, um, it, it took a while for me to find something that, that worked. And, and that's kind of a principle, a, a overarching principle in the book is that is the idea of patience and just, just realizing that I am not the primary painter of this reality mm-hmm. that I'm always in a process of receiving things. So I receive the good stuff and I receive the bad stuff. It just, it, I might've played a causal role in some of that, but ultimately yeah. it just comes into my life. And the question is, is not who's to blame or why did that happen? The big question is what am I going to do about it? And so you, you keep working hard, you keep trying, you keep going to the doctors, you keep doing your, 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 uh, your, your therapies, your rehab, whatever, whatever it may be, you just keep doing it and you hold on. Um, Mm-hmm. And, and eventually things usually work out and um, a metaphor I use for this in chapter two at the end of pen to pain subsection in that chapter the original article was entitled melancholy and it was the last thing I wrote or it was the last day that I've had a serious depressive suicidal episode January 30th 2023 and I, I took to writing at my pain instead of writing about it. So, mm. so you, so pen to pain. So, so using writing to kind of attack my feelings instead of just talking about them. And I conclude that by saying, hold on to your kite of a life where some days it'll fly high, some others it'll fly low. Some days it'll tossed to and fro, others it will not. But regardless of what happens to your kite, the key is to keep a strong grip on that string. Hmm. And maybe that's the right perspective, to hold on to your life like a string to a kite, because that's all you can do. That's true. Trust him with the weather. Mm -hmm. So it's, and, and kind of, well, I don't want to go on a monologue here, but I, uh, there, there's a lot of faith elements in the book. There's a lot of religious faith, uh, yeah. elements. there's theology, there's philosophy, there's personal memoir, there's poetry, mm-hmm. there's fiction, nonfiction, and it's a very human book. It's very yes. personal to me. So, so sometimes it might feel preachy. I don't know if you got that at all, but, but yeah, I put it this way where it's like, there's nothing in there. Like if you find something difficult or uncomfortable, realize I found it difficult or uncomfortable first. Like it was something that I had to deal with or I, I used, or I, I, a truth I dealt with and wrestled with, uh, that, that played a role in my recovery. And so, and, but everything I mention in there, I, I mention it in a personal manner. I, I don't really 
say anything that's like absolute like you are are this i always put it under the umbrella of of myself like yeah uh, yeah it's not written in a way where you're going you're going to hell if you don't right. repent it it's it's a very personal in-depth look from your perspective right but there what i love about this is it doesn't have to necessarily umbrella the brain injury there is something in this book that can apply to everyone's life right. injured or non-injured right you know and I, and I love that i want to read something real quick if you don't mind yeah this this is in his book and there if you've ever felt that you are alone in your journey and no one understands you and you can't put into words how you're feeling this right here in chapter two, pen to pain. I love that title. This spoke to me and I know it's going to speak to all of the viewers out there. I just want to read this real quick. It says, I am describing the other me, the me I hate to see but must see every day. The me no one else ever really knows about. If others really knew about the other me, they would quickly be, uh, they would be quick to befriend another. When I try and tell others about this other me, they nod their heads and act like they understand, but I tell you they cannot. I know they have another them. I get that. They don't understand the other me because I cannot fully describe it. For when I do describe it, I am describing it as normal me. If only I could tell them about the other me when I am the other me. The darkness in me is blinding in moments where I am the other me. I am fully conceived the other me is who I really am. The other me is me fully me. When I am overtaken by the other me, I incur dementia and loss of remembrance of normal me. I drop my morals. I lose my values. I forget my family and friends. I care no longer about the status of upcoming reputation. And this is all fitting because as you remember, when the other me is me, there never was any other me to begin with. So I conceive. The other me hates the world. The other me hates normal me. The other me taunts and laughs at normal me. The other me wishes normal me would die equally as much as normal me wishes the other me would die. The other me considers no other, not even me ironically, just itself. I hate the other me. That is so deep and that's so real. And that describes perfectly what survivors feel on a daily basis. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to get emotional, but it is, it's very real. And I applaud you for being brave to put that in your book, to put that out there and to just to be vulnerable. Yeah. So I, I thank you so much for, for everything that you're doing. And not only, not only that, let's talk about the after effects of your brain injury, because you didn't just take the injury and say, okay, this is me now. You did something that dare I say it's um, near impossible. You said, I'm going to become an attorney. So tell us how that happened. Yeah. Well, thank you, Rob. Uh, very encouraging for you to share uh, that you were moved by a portion in the book. And if you recall, at the end of the preface, I said, uh, if there's ever a moment when it feels like, well, let me read the first part. Okay. Uh, while I want the reader to deal with this book as he sees fit, I also wrote this book to deal with the reader. The former will happen whenever the book is read, but the latter can never happen because an object like a book will not penetrate a subject like him. Thus, if there's ever a moment when it feels like this book is speaking to you or moving you, 
Understand now that it isn't. Only as somebody can, and it won't be me. Uh, so it's 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 you know echoing the the idea of the divine subject yeah. uh, speaking through the words. And so no, I, I'm encouraged that you would share that with me. So I, before the accident happened, a month before it happened, or about a month, August 2nd, 2015, I proposed as a 17 year old to my, to my now wife, Chelsea, her hand in marriage. And she, she said, yes. So we were engaged. I was 17. She was 19. And that was a huge like game changer. I'm so thankful that happened because a lot of times when teenagers have serious traumatic brain injuries, they're confined to their situation and confined to their home. Usually their parents who um, love them well and due to that, that kind of love that they have from the parents, there isn't really a whole lot of motivation for the child to go beyond their situation. There's no pull. It's, it's very much parents are like, Oh, you're doing good, sweetie. You're doing good. Like, Oh, you, even, even if they're not doing good, like even if they're acting out in public or are not pronouncing words correctly, like Chelsea was one older than me. So I was already motivated to like prove to her that I could be a man and things like that. And, and then we do get married. And, and then I am trying to prove that I'm trying to prove I can be a husband. I can be a leader and working my way, having that external pull that was outside of my normal situation with like my parents or my peers at school. So yeah. And if I didn't propose to her, there's no way we would have gotten married. I, I mean, I had to like remember her name after the accident. When I woke up from the coma, we had to, we literally did have to fall in love again. And I, I had to, cause there was a lot of things I didn't rem remember initially. And so we got married six months after the accident, the day we planned to get married. And yeah, I didn't really even know what was going on. Uh, I don't feel like, and, but I'm so thankful we did get married because she, she loved me well and strong. Um, but she wasn't, she wasn't going to put up with me like not being the best she knew I could be. And yeah. so she, like I, if you remember the beginning of chapter six, where Chelsea was honest with me and um, she would call me out when I'd act out in public or not pronounce a word correctly. She, she practiced it with me. So having that personal push, relational mm -hmm. push as well, uh, was very impactful for me. And, if you compare my outcome to other people, a huge element in that or variable is that is Chelsea is having her in my life and uh, having that external pull and other people can have it. They don't necessarily have to get married at 18, but it, it's not a terrible decision despite what the world says. Uh, if you understand what marriage is about and you're, yeah. you're genuinely committed to someone else um, beyond external things. It's not about the money. It's not about the looks. It's about uh, a union of who's not a union of what's a uh, union yeah. of people. And so, but again, it doesn't need to be marriage. Uh, it can be just some passion that you have, um, that excites you and motivates you to get up in the morning, motivates you to, to, to be better. So, and it's hard to get that when you're alone. And it's hard to get yes. that when you're just stuck at your house with your parents. Mm. Uh, that's just the, the truth. It's nothing against the parents. It's just the, the way it is. You're yeah. not really motivated uh, as, a, as a youth. Now, so Chelsea, we got married, moved on campus at the S Southern Baptist Seminary in Louisville, Kentucky, because again, I was wanting to go into ministry. So I was taking some dual enrollment classes while I was in high school and moved on campus in Louisville and Chelsea wanted me to get a lawyer for my injury case. So this is how we found Matthew Shad in New Albany, Indiana. And Matt is very uh, 
great reputation, very experienced uh, trial lawyers. He's dealt with a lot of traumatic brain injury cases. And so we, we were just drawn to him. Excuse me. And the day we met him for our consultation, he was really drawn to us. And we just developed this relationship that was really good. He worked our case. It settled really quickly. And in meeting Matt, I got inspired to go to law school. Not because he told me, but just because I kind of like the idea of writing the book. It's like it just kind of came to me. It popped in my head while Chelsea, Chelsea and I were on our, our honeymoon in the Bahamas. I remember sitting up in the hotel bed with this idea of going to law school. And I knew if Chelsea was for it, that this is what should happen. So uh, I'm like, babe, what if I go to law school? And she's like, well, it'll be hard, but that's a great idea. So she was for it. So I was like, yeah, that's basically God's will for me. So I, I've always that's trusted awesome. her implicitly. So I, and, but so it, it wasn't just Matt motivating me, but like it was something that kept going on in the back of my head that the doctors and the therapists kept telling me over and over again. They kept saying, Cameron, due to the nature of your TBI, the hardest things for you are going to be higher level thinking, executive function, just use, using your brain. So I, I genuinely just thought to myself, man, if I could do the law school admission test, I could do anything else. Yes. And so I spent like six months studying for it while I was in the seminary and um, yeah, I studied, oh, it's so hard to study for that test. Oh my gosh. And I couldn't have done it without Chelsea again. Cause like there were times I wanted multi, many times where I was like, I don't want to do it anymore. And she's like, you should, you should keep, keep doing it. And she, I remember she practiced, uh, she did some practice tests with me before. Um, but a lot of it was stuff I just had to do on my own. And I got a high enough score to get into at the time, a top 30 law school. Indiana University Maurer School of Law in Bloomington, Indiana. And so I, I did that. And so I said, if I did the LSAT, I could do anything else. I kind of did go on to do just about everything else. Because in law school, at the end of my first year, Chelsea gave birth to our firstborn, Scarlett. Beautiful, beautiful. She's wonderful. And then at the end of my second year of law school, Chelsea gave birth to triplets. Yes. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. So all so I, I, <laughs> it, it is efficient, mind you. <laughs> but I, I always tell people, I'm like, yeah, so I fathered four children all with the same woman in law school. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. But yeah, no, it's a tremendous blessing and God's grace that I did do that. And I still graduated law school on track with my peers and still passed the bar exam licensed in Indiana and Kentucky in two states working for the same attorney who worked my case eight years ago. His name is Matt, right? Yep, yeah. Matt you. Shad. Yep. So whenever you did, did you, did you tell him that you had went to school before you passed the bar or how did, how did this happen? Oh, uh, wait, what do you mean? Whenever you went to him to, I guess I'm assuming you went to him and said, Hey, I'm an attorney now. Would you like to hire me? Oh yeah. No, did, no, that's a good, that's that a good question. Right. No, it's a good question. <laughs> like, that's what I was kind of hinting at is we just kind of developed this, uh, affection and relation with one another. Like he was drawn to us and, and we just, uh, he just got to know us more. And, and so he, he kept in touch with me while I was in law school and I was pretty much an independent contractor for him. He'd give me, some research assignments, um, document review and stuff while I was in law school. And I interned with him in the summer before law school. And that's, so the book is really cool because he wrote the foreword of the book. I love that. And then the appendix, I don't know if you looked at this, but he wrote the, the appendix is the letter of recommendation that he wrote for me in 2017 for my law school application. So he kind of hugs the book <laughs> and, and it's a cool in another way, because Matt and I don't share the same worldview. He's not a, uh, or like religious or Christian guy. So it's, it, it's nice having his perspective, um, and his, his love and support for me through all of it. Uh, but in writing 
writing those things in the book. So, yeah, so I interned with him summer before law school, and I interned with him kind of throughout law school, pretty much. So, and we just, I, I do mention in chapter five, I don't know if you read that one, um, but I do mention in chapter five how I got the, the job officially with him. It was over dinner with him and his wife, and and he came over to where we were, we were staying at the time uh, to see our newborn, to see Scarlett. So this would be in 2019. And we had dinner, and he asked me what my plans were for law school, like after law school. And I said, well, I was thinking, I was thinking I'd work with you. And he's like, yeah. And so he just shook my hand and that was it. <laughs> wow. How did I get the job? A good old fashioned handshake. <laughs> That's amazing. I love yeah. that. Yeah. No, it's very, and I, I highlight that idea of, of Matt living out a subjective practice where it's not about objective results, uh, you know, numbers and stuff like, even though he gets numbers like that big TBI case he had was a $23 million case. So he, he gets the numbers, he gets all the results, but, but he's very relationally driven. He's very much about like making sure his employees are happy, making mm -hmm. sure his clients are cared for and, and feel supported and heard. So, yeah, so he, uh, I say he was drawn to me as me because there was nothing objectively impressive about me when he met me. I just had a brain injury. I was young and I looked like a dumb guy get married at 18 like <laughs> and so I it's just I didn't have a resume I didn't have anything like that but he was just uh, he was drawn to me as a person so I'm sure he probably kidded you a lot about getting married so young <laughs> no he he didn't but I, I've got clients that that do say some things about that <laughs> yeah <laughs> sometimes and I never did I didn't get to show you this but so this is this is the hardcover version. Um, the hardcover turned out really nice. Um, yeah. But I got a 3D model of the skull. I love that. <laughs> and that's your actual skull, right? I mean, like actual as in an actual 3D well, model. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah, it's an actual 3D model of it. Uh, so so this is all artificial now over here. Yeah. Now, not to get personal, does it, do you feel different or does it just feel normal? Well, it's, it's certainly sensitive on this side. Yeah. Like I don't, mm -hmm. I don't really ever sleep on this side of my head. Uh, is it tender? I, yeah. It's just, it's just sensitive. Like in this, these areas, although I don't yeah. want to tell people cause I don't want them to punch me. Uh, <laughs> you know, they'll know where the sweet spot is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Don't uh, sell your secrets. <laughs> yeah. So, but you know, they did a great job because you really can't, when my hair is shorter, you can see the scar line. It's like an L, uh -huh. but, um, and you can, uh, how's it go? You can like, oh, I can you like, totally really, can't tell. yeah. Um, but you can, you can totally feel it though. Like if, if you were to be touching my head right now, mm -hmm. you would, you'd feel the divot. It's a divot. It's concaved inward. Um, but no, I mean, it definitely could have looked a lot worse. Um, oh, yeah. I mean, it you know, came out great. Yeah, they, they did a good job. So. Yeah, I was concerned, uh, not concerned, but I was I was curious if you still felt sensations there because after my accident, I it's been four years, and I'm still tender in this area right here. Yeah, yeah. I'm just, I'm probably always going to be, like I was playing basketball probably this far like five years ago, but I was playing and this guy set a screen and his arm hit me right there. I was oh, like playing no. defense and oh, it, it like kind of went kind of black for just a second and just, yeah, oh, it just really disoriented me. So, so I took a break from that for a little bit and good idea, <laughs> but I, <laughs> yeah, so I just, and then I used, I used to wear a helmet while I was playing basketball, which was not fun because it's it's very sweaty and um, it's mm -hmm. that's disorienting in and of itself because you, 
and frustrating e- equilibrium you know because you can't like hear and if you can't hear very well you, you can't balance very well and so it's oh, all yeah. interconnected so do you have the sensitivity to like lights and sounds and things like that it's oh that's so good you mentioned that because i i used to it's only been in the last year or two that I've really started to own up to my limitations or at least recognize that I'm probably that, that these issues I have are from the TBI Mm. and that they're probably going to, they are going to be there forever. Yeah. And, and I just never really noticed. I, I guess I just never really put it together. But again, within the last year or two, I've just started to really, recognize my limitations so like i went to the kentucky justice association conference kja conference last thursday and friday in lexington kentucky and we were at the the hilton downtown lexington location hotel and you walk into the hotel and there's the you know the front where you check in and register you know get your room and then on the right, it's this like hallway, like kind of hallway that has the bathrooms. There's the men's on your left and then the women's on your right. But once you turn to this hall, it's not a very long hall, but it's just, it's its own hall towards the bathrooms. The floor is different and the background is different. It's like the wallpaper and everything. It's just, it's very bright and mm-hmm. To me, it seemed like the lighting was different too. <laughs> and because when I went from looking at the the guy checking me in and then I look at the bathroom, now all of a sudden, when I look at this bathroom or towards the bathrooms, it's like everything's flickering. Mm-hmm. Like I thought there was something wrong with the lights and like it just, everything was flickering. It was very disorienting and I, but I, I had to go to the bathroom, so I just kept kept walking. Um, and I come out, it's the same thing. And I, I started going to a different bathroom while I was at the conference because I was like, I don't want to experience that again. But eventually, a couple times, I, I had to go to that one. And one time I came out, this is probably after the second or third time I had gone in. One time I came out and I, I went to the people at the, the front desk and I said, Hey, you guys, you guys should probably do something about the flickering lights. Um, uh, you know, cause people have seizures and I'm a, I'm a personal injury attorney and, and you guys, you guys should probably fix that. And they both look at it. Uh-huh. They both look at it and they're like, we don't see anything. <laughs> and, and I'm like, what do you mean? <laughs> and, one guy was like, well, maybe a little. And he's, we'll, we'll, we'll get our engineer, structural engineer, uh, we'll let him know about it. And, and then I talked about it with my wife after I got back from the conference. And she's like, I showed her a picture of it. Cause, cause when I took a picture of this, you know, hall, there's no, you do the live photo, there's no flickering. It, yeah. So while I was holding my camera there, I could see it wasn't flickering in the camera, but when I'm looking at it, it's like everything's flickering. It was it was very uh, bizarre. And Chelsea helped me understand that it's because it was over. It was because of the hypersensitivity mm-hmm. I developed after the TBI. It was too much stimulus st- stimuli for my brain. Uh, yeah. Very bright white, very bright LED lights, and something about that floor. Again, it was a different floor than the, the regular yeah. lobby area. I just, it was just too much for my my brain to handle. So, it, it was the most bizarre thing. And so I, that's a long way to answer your question, but it is an example of a very yeah. recent experience I've had where lights or sounds like, like when I've been at a, a concert, well, not, not really a concert, but, but like a party or something and music's loud. Like, yeah, that mm. I, I don't handle that well. 
I don't like that. But I can play my own music loud. Have you yeah, noticed that? I, yeah, I have. Yeah, like you can play your own music loud and it doesn't it doesn't bother me. But if so, if there's something that I'm not focused on or I'm not the one causing it, uh, that can be really um, bothersome. And two, I think if you have more than one thing going on, forget about it. Because I can't concentrate on two things at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, can, it can just, yeah, it can depend on what the task is. Like, I mean, if you're um, like doing, well, what do you mean? Like, give me an example. Okay. Like say you're someone, here's a great example. If my wife's on the phone talking yeah. and I'm trying to read a book or watch television or whatever, those two things cancel each other out. I, I see what you mean. Yeah. I can't read the book because of her talking. Right. And I'm listening and I can't, you know what I'm saying? They're, it's like both sides of her brain are fighting each other at the same time. Right. No. Yeah, that's that's definitely understandable. And and I have noticed music for me has been really I'm not sure if it's just because of being a father of four kids under the age of two and all the screaming and all that stuff. But, but I've really enjoyed headphones and music and being able to kind of zone in to tasks, whether it's, you know, my work or, or writing or um, exercise. Uh, I found that very therapeutic for me. And I myself am not a musician by any means, but I do like to write in a rhythmic kind of way. A lot of my writing has uh, a rhyme to it. Um, and there are explicit poems in the book. And uh, those, those again, play into the, the subject, the subjective, like the uh, emotional yeah. parts of the book. And they help bring it to a different level. And I, so, so I enjoy uh, music in, in that sense and it's reflective in the way I write. Yeah, I can see that. It helps to have distractions. That's one thing that I learned. Um, I used to play the prelude at our church and I had to give that up because of all the anxiety just from, from the stress of playing and the stimulation of everybody being in the room, I just had to give it up. Um, I do still play occasionally. I don't play like I used to, but music has been something that calms me down. Yeah. Anything that can distract you from your, from your injury is, is a good thing in my opinion. Yeah, no, no, it's good. And, and you, I don't think you need to see it as a distraction though. Uh, just see it as a, as a, as a good thing in and of itself. Like it's a, it's yeah. a good thing to enjoy beautiful things, beautiful music, mm -hmm. beautiful places, beautiful people. Like it's it, beauty is in God's design and it's of him. So it, enjoying those things uh, is, is a good thing. Yeah. And, so do you plan on writing any more books? I do, because you asked me before we started recording if I like to write before the accident, and I did. I did. I did write while I was in high school, and I. But the accident, and the brain subsequent brain injury is what kind of elevated my writing to a whole nother level. Mm. Really, because it opened up a whole new personality for me. A uh, darker personality, uh, a a more a more relatable, empathetic kind of person, because I've I've been pretty darn low in life, and been there for a while, and very very difficult, and so, and that's what my wife has said to me is that the accident was good for me because it it rounded me out, because before I was very very optimistic. They called me the eternal optimist. Everything was good. Everything was great. 
uh, <laughs> cloud nine all the time. But the accident again brought me on another planet, another world, and I I didn't like how I felt. I didn't like what I couldn't do, and I hated who I'd become. Uh. And so I really, yeah, like pen to pain, took took to writing about my feelings and then writing at them. And so writing's been a, a way for me to uh, work through the injury and uh, find hope and encouragement uh, for myself and then lend that to other people. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. And, and going to law school really helped perfect my the written craft because like in law school, you're, it's all about writing concisely, making sure every word counts. It, it's all meaningful. Cut, cut out all the fluff. You don't need that. So every single thing in the book is intentional. Um, like every yeah. word is intentional. Um, the titles, the subtitles, the headings, uh, table of contents, any of the pictures that are in there. It's just all very intentional. I really spent, I spent over 600 hours on this 12 all nighters. Uh, wow. My wife knows I, I had multiple, several all nighters and she's like, Cameron, <laughs> your, your brain's already injured enough. <laughs> so, but I, I was just really, really into the book. And so, um, and yeah. So to explain the cover, if you want. Yeah, please. So, Saving the subject. So it's interesting. The reason this word, the subject, is difficult. So from a distance, it's hard to read that word. Mm -hmm. And that's intentional because kind of the goal of the book is to find the human subject in a world full of objects. So an object like a brain injury, like a brain. Okay. So now, now my brain's injured. Well, in order to have hope beyond the brain injury, I need to figure out if I am more than a brain. Mm. So am I more than an object like a brain injury? Well, in yeah. order to be more than an object like a brain injury, I need to be more than a brain, more than an mm. object. So I need to be a subject. So, so trying to under, so the book is about trying to understand how I can be more than a brain injury, how I can be more than a an object, finding the human subject in a world full of objects. So hence why the word subject is difficult to read because it's hard to find a, a person in a world like ours where oftentimes people are reduced to what they can do, what they can't do. Uh, they're yeah. reduced to performance, socioeconomic status, you know, money, all that stuff. Uh, mm -hmm. When it's like, we are so much more than that. And, but, and we all say that, but it's like, how? How am I more valuable than this bottle of water? Uh, mm. Who's to say I am? So uh, finding the subject in a world full of objects. So that's ultimately what the book is trying to do. And then how I found you when I almost lost me. A lot of this book, the whole book is meant to be deeply, um, like you need to really think about this book. Like this mm -hmm. isn't a book you just speed read through. Uh, yeah. It's a book you, I've read it several times and I'm still super encouraged about how things fit together and how it's all, there's a cohesive narrative or a cohesive uh, -ness to the whole book. It's not just a disjointed, um, I call it like an ordered chaos. Uh, and there is yeah, a, it's a like that. Yeah, but there is, which is reflective of life in and of itself, but also uh -huh. in a post TBI life where things yes. are just kind of crazy now and difficult. So, but, but it was intentional the way I ordered the book. Each chapter is intentional, uh, the way they build on like, a kind of arguments or, or building on one another. And so, but if you, you think about the details, uh, you can kind of get different interpretations from them. And I want you to make the book personal for yourself as I, I did in writing it. So how I found you when I almost lost me, sometimes people think the you is referring 
to God or referring to Chelsea or something. Um, that wasn't my original intent, but I can understand why people would think that or yeah. how they could use it that way. Uh, but my original intent for how I found you was in a philosophical sense of like finding the subject yourself. in a world. Yeah. Finding yourself, finding mm -hmm. the self in a world of objects. So like, because I almost lost myself, like I almost died. It, it made me think about life more deeply and how I, I need to be more than an object. I need to yeah. be more than this brain injury. So when I, when I found who I could always be, that, that's when I found who you could be too. Uh, regardless of whatever happens to you. And, wow, that's deep. Yeah, and then the, you know, shattered with this glass shattered effect is mm -hmm. reflective of the literal shattering of the windshield of the vehicle with my skull. And then it's also reflective of a of identity and trying to rebuild yourself again, uh, putting your pieces of your life back together. And yeah. of course the skull is a literal image of, of my skull, uh, but also human fragility and mortality and how life, um, rebuilding yourself again after trauma. Man, I, I have like a billion questions I could ask you <laughs> because there's so much in this book. And if you guys, I mean, it, it, buy the book. You won't regret it. There's something literally in there for everybody. And especially if you're a brain injury survivor. I mean, I was not, I was a reader before. If I loved a book, I would sit down and two nights it was done. I was ready for my next book. Wow. But it took me about three years to finally read a book again. Oh. Yeah. And I was a little apprehensive at first because I'm the kind of person that, I have to completely reread what I just read to understand yeah. it. So it, it, it's getting better. Yeah. But uh, I don't know if you experienced this or not. I have, I have a lot of memory issues and there was a time in my life where I, I could not tell you what I had, you know, what I'd done an hour ago. Yeah. But I mean, it's, we, we probably got a, about two weeks possibly that I can remember back to. And my wife is constantly reminding me of people that have passed away because I'll talk about them. Like they're still here. And oh, I don't wow. remember. Yeah. I don't remember ever attending the funeral. Um, just last night I texted a friend of mine cause I'd saw somebody on Facebook and I, I sent her a screenshot. I said, can you believe this person got married? I said, I guess they got divorced. And, and then she replied back. She was, she passed away two years ago. Mm. I had no idea. Yeah. So it's, it's a journey. Yeah. You know, that, that's yeah. uncharted yeah. territory. <laughs> and, and maybe a word of encouragement kind of going back to something I was getting at earlier is like accepting the way things are mm -hmm. like is, is huge because the first stage of grief is denial mm -hmm. it's denial so in the last stage i believe there's five yes uh, i is, think so is acceptance yeah and one thing the book is the book's trying the book's doing a lot there's a lot in the book and like you said other test readers i had reading it before it was published said there's something in here for everyone. And again, it's a very human book. So, but, but the idea of self-denial and starting with acceptance, like hmm. instead of getting there, uh, this doesn't mean I'm not, I'm not really even talking about grief itself. Uh, I'm just using that as an example of a point where like not defining your reality by the bad things that happen to you or by the bad diagnoses you receive from other people, like defining it by something bigger than yourself, bigger than this world, out of this world, literally, yeah. uh, that nobody can take from you is of immense importance. 
because it allows you to accept the things of this world because you see something so much bigger mm. and, and you believe in it and you pursue it and you love it. So, so one, one of the ways I wrote about this concept was in the interlude, uh, which was probably, I don't know if you, if you were able to read that, um, it, I think it's was very, that the beginning. No, no, it's very dense. Um, it's very, there's a lot of depth to it. It's, it's one of the favorite, my favorite things that I wrote in this book. Um, but other people, like, it, it's something you got to read if, multiple times. Because you mentioned having to reread things. Well, this, yeah. there's nothing wrong with doing that in this book. Like, that's expected. Like, I hope people reread this stuff and don't gloss over it. Because it, there's, there's, like I said, everything was intentional. There's and, little gems here and yeah. there that you pick up and you're going, wow, I needed yeah. that. And, and again, if you were to give it a second read through the whole thing, you, you'll you'll see different things and how they connect with other parts of the book and how, hmm. because some people that are like one guy who read it, he, he thought it was almost like separate essays, but another guy that read it more closely, he's like, no, you reference things from chapter one that you mentioned in chapter three. And so hmm. it's, it, you're connect, it's all connected, but the part is on page 77 the interlude. Um, so it's the third full paragraph down. It says, life is far more difficult when we willfully deny what is before our eyes. To question what God has said does not just include the biblical scriptures, but also what God has spoken into one's life. The people around you, the body encompassing you, the resources supporting you, the home sheltering you, the trauma battling you, and the future awaiting you. All this has been received by you. You may have played a causal part in some of that, but regardless, this law has come your way, and the more you argue against it, the slower you are to deal with it. Thus, argumentation often takes the form of distraction. So, so you, you mentioning the memory uh, issues and, and struggles it helps to just say it's okay it, it, yeah. it's okay the way things are it's like yeah I, I can't remember that and I, like I don't have what I what I used to have but it's like no look at what I've got and work with it and yeah yeah like it, it, just the subjective perspective being able to see things different see the see the problem mm -hmm. not as the ultimate problem right and so so i say how did i get better after my injury i i say it was by elevating my subjective problems over my objective problems realizing there are bigger problems that i am dealing with as a person mm -hmm. in in my character in my in my relationship with god and my relationship with others like personally things that need to be improved over the external injuries I might be having yeah. and dealing with. So yeah, that's how I've kind of handled mine is, is I just, I roll with the punches. People will say, well, aren't you hurting today? I'm hurting every day, but I don't, I don't complain about it because and this is how I look at it. There are several people out there in much worse shape than I am. Yeah. It always what right worse. do I have to complain? Yeah. No, no, Rob, I can tell you're a man of genuine, passion and uh, care for other people and you're yeah. very you've got a great heart and a good head on your shoulders so i i really think um, you're doing what you're supposed to be doing yeah it took me a while to figure it out I, I prayed nightly god give me a purpose for this pain and then here we are you yeah. know I, i've turned this into helping shine a light right where Absolutely. it needed to be shined right oh yeah yeah, and so that's the power of the cross because the cross mm. is an object, okay? Yeah. It, it's, a, it's a terrible object. Yet we put it on buildings and we put it on our T-shirts, our tattoos, our jewelry. But historically speaking, the object of the cross was a symbol of, of capital punishment, of crucifixion, like the worst mm. way to die. And yet yeah. we 
we do all this stuff with it now we, we show it off but that'd be like putting an ak-47 on our buildings on our t-shirts or our tattoos and jewelry yeah. but we don't we don't do that so so how why do we do that now not because the object changed but because the subject who who dealt with that object was great so that's what transformed awesome. the horrible object so in the same yeah. way we're called as christians and as people to do the same thing with our suffering and difficulties is, is you know deny yourself pick up the cross pick it up and, and bring it to the Lord and, and follow me. So, so that's the formulaic for, for all of these problems we all face. It's not just TBI, it's just all the suffering. Mm -hmm. Life is suffering. There's so much suffering in this world. Right. And so taking that horrible object and turning it into something beautiful. And so now like this skull is, it, it's a terrible object, but it's reflective of a, a beautiful uh, outcome and subject uh, yeah. myself and, and my life. and what God has done and what he's done through me. So yeah, it's just, uh, the opportunity is, uh, there's, there's much opportunity for all of us to turn our horrible objects into something beautiful. Uh, That's awesome. I could not have said that better myself. So, um, I don't want to, I know we're getting long on time, but I, I don't want to, miss some of the opportunities to ask you a few other questions. Yeah. Um, you set up a foundation or. Yeah. I set up a nonprofit organization in 2017 called voice of TBI that helps people with traumatic brain injuries. And we, we were meeting once a month for a few years. And then when I was in law school, we, we had to put a pause on it and we did a little bit of stuff during law school, but not very much. And then I brought it back in 2021 and we did it for about a year and a half. Um, but then with the start of this year, which now it's almost over, but 2020, mm -hmm. 2024, uh, we, we, we never really picked it back up again because I just got super busy. And so I don't, yeah. I don't really foresee there being any more, the business itself, the organization itself still exists and, there might be something down the road, but I don't, I don't foresee anything opening up. Um, but it was a great thing. I, I mean, I still connect and talk with people that were a part of the group and they still kind of follow uh, the things I'm doing. And so it's like my, my role with helping the traumatic brain injury community has evolved. Uh, into yeah. Something you're, it's kind of shifted. Different. Right. Over to the attorney side, right? Right. The attorney and, and then now the author uh, side and supporting people in that way. And, yeah. and just just kind of being the voice that I, I uh, automatically am in whatever I'm doing now. Uh, yeah. So. There's nothing wrong with that. Right. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's it, pe people have said it's inspirational for them. So that's good. Yeah, it is. It, it really is. And I, I think that you're going to, your story will resonate with a lot of people that doesn't think that there's anything else that they can do. There's always more. There's always more. Yeah. Yeah. So Cameron, before we wrap up, is there anything that you're passionate about? Oh, wait a minute. I, I have to, Ashley wasn't able to, to be here today, but she did send me a question. She wanted me to ask you. She's, she says, what is your best advice that you could give our viewers? I think so the scripture first Timothy four seven, it's either four seven or four six. Um, the apostle Paul asks a very profound question. What do you have that you have not received? And I've touched on this throughout our, our time together, Rob, but what do you have that you have not received? So we're just receiving this stuff, um, the pain, the, the joy, the loss, the victory, like it's just, it just comes into our life. And I didn't choose to exist. I didn't choose my parents. I didn't choose 
where I'd be born, where I'd live, where I'd grow up. And, and there's just so much of this life that we just receive. And again, it comes down to response. And a way that I found helpful for this perspective is something I actually put together well at my keynote address I gave at my old high school on the nine year brain anniversary, you called it brain injury anniversary, uh, nine years exactly after the accident, I, which happened during my senior year of high school, I went back to my high school, gave a keynote address uh, about the journey and an inspirational message. And then I did a Q and A about the book, but I used the analogy and metaphor of the painter. So I say, I said that I used to think I was the one painting my life. Okay, I, I was painting this life of ministry and, and, and marriage, and that was the life I thought I was painting. And you hit by the car, shakes the canvas clean, and now uh, we need to paint something different. And then I found someone else to paint with me. So, so I thought I was the only one painting. Had the accident. Now I've got Chelsea. We're painting together. We're co-painters of this life, which is mm. awesome uh, to find someone like that, whether it's a really close friend or, uh, I mean, it doesn't really get any closer than a spouse. Uh, right. So uh, marriage is awesome. And so having a co-painter like that. But then as time went on, Chelsea and I just started achieving these remarkable things and, and uh, the Lord just put all these things together. And so as all these things started stacking up in our life, I realized and better, better understood that I was not the ultimate painter involved mm. here. And, um, so, and when I understood that and I shared that with other people, it, it's good news for you that we are not the ultimate painter because mm. it means when it, when it, when it feels like I'm done or, or you feel like you're done or the world acts like it's done, we can all rest assured knowing that he's not done. He's not done yes. painting. There's, there's still more of, of a, of a picture to be put together here. Like, the, like the, he's still painting. You're still here. You're still alive. So, yeah. so you've just, hold on to that kite of life, like hold on and, and keep doing what you're supposed to be doing. And we all, so you've got your medications, you've got your therapies, you've got your appointments. Like you just keep doing it. You keep mm -hmm. holding on you keep being patient and realize that you're not the primary painter in this, that there's a bigger painter and mm. you might not understand what the point of all this is now, but you don't know how you're going to feel about today, 10 years from now, or even a, a year from now, or even then you don't know how you're going to feel about today, tomorrow. That's right. And so it's like just having uh, an understanding and like that. So you mentioned the nonprofit, the original slogan was um, improvement over injury for voice of TBI. Uh, but when we reopened in 2021, I changed it to rethinking traumatic brain injury because I, I thought it got more to the core of what I was trying to do for people, uh, not just helping TBI survivors, but also helping their caregivers because the caregivers are some of the people that need the most care. Sometimes, uh, they've got yes. lots to deal with and, and they're making so many sacrifices and they've got their own struggles they're having to deal with in light of. Uh, the, the struggles that the TBI person's having. So rethinking traumatic brain injury, like, like how can you get better? Well, obviously the objective help is great. The medications are great. Therapists are great. But, but, but man, like if you could just see your life differently, like if you could see your loss differently, like wouldn't that be awesome? Like if I, if I wasn't so swayed by, the misfortune that's come up on my life. Like mm -hmm. if, I, if I just saw it differently, we talked about yeah. having a positive perspective and stuff, but like, but not, but I'm talking about like an internal change, not, 
not like oh you think happy thoughts but like but like actually having a basis for being happy because you understand that there's a good god in heaven who's painting a picture with your life that's that's so much better than you could even imagine mm -hmm. and and that he's good yeah this world is bad yeah this injury is bad but he's good and he's the painter and he's the one doing all this stuff and and there's joy for you today and there's joy for you tomorrow uh, and and that doesn't mean it needs to always feel good it's okay for, for there to be bad days like oh yeah that, that, that's just the way it is and, and and that's what i was telling rob it's like you, you've got to just be okay with it not being okay and just realizing that this is this is the lot I've received. This is the hand I've been dealt. And I just, I give it back to the one who ultimately gave it to me and uh, entrusting him to do something great with it. Uh, and, and like with Rob here, I don't, you don't realize the people you're impacting. Like Rob doesn't realize the people he's impacting with this awesome podcast show he's doing. And, and so it's like, having faith and having confidence in a higher painter, a higher power that is, and he's a personal power. That's, mm. that's the crew. It's not just this abstract force, but just like you think you're a person, that's the way it is for him. But even, uh, even more so, uh, in a perfect sort of way. And so that person is there, uh, for you to pray to and talk to, uh, and, and you've got other people in your life that are there to, to talk to and work through, whether it's your therapist, your coaches, your friends, your spouses. Um, we need people. People need people. And so, so simply put, my word of advice is uh, to hold on to your kite of life and trust him with the weather. Yeah. You know, you said so much there that was just – we could do a whole show just on that blurb of what you just said. I think when we change our perspective and we look at ourselves as the canvas, the canvas can always accept paint. Right. You know, yeah. I don't know if you remember you Bob yeah. Ross. Remember Bob Ross? Um, the painter. He okay. would always paint the, the trees and he talked but really soft. and. Yeah. Happy little mistakes. He didn't make uh, happy accidents or whatever it was he would say. That's how I look at life is, you know, some of the most profound things that has happened to me has been because of my worst days. Right. You can let your worst day sink you or you can make your worst day say, how can I make this better? How can I do better tomorrow? Yeah. You know. It's okay to be in the valleys, but it's not okay to stay there. That's, that's right. That's what I always said. Right. Yeah. 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 And uh, again, like the cross is just this juxtaposition between loss and victory. So, so that's why chapter seven, the last, last sub subsection or sub chapter the last essay I guess in the book is loss and victory and it's very much a you know it's it's another kind of thing I favorite thing I wrote in here that's why I put it at the end kind of as a close mm -hmm. and it, it's got some poetry in there and and it it really is a wrestling with that paradox of loss and victory and, and how it's okay. There, there are good days, there's bad days, there's loss, there's victory, there's, and the cross is the exemplar of this and, and that he has ultimately been victorious mm -hmm. over sin and death and all the brokenness. And so it's like we are getting to experience that sort of uh, life that Jesus Christ himself went through and, and mm. loss and victory and ultimately as the faith tells us is that 
we will experience ultimate peace and healing uh, when we're when we're done with our mission here on earth. And so oh, yeah. if you're still here, you keep going, you keep strong and you just do what you know you need to do. Like Rob is reading and reading is great. Reading is a great thing for the brain. Uh, and of course there's like diet and supplements and things like that. But, but yeah. mental activities like reading, chess, Sudoku, um, just finding a challenging activity just not giving up and just keep yeah. going and whatever you can do, just do it and keep yeah. doing it and trust him for better days. You never know what good you will accomplish possibly for somebody else. Right. Right. You know, exactly. exactly. I started this podcast for, for me just to tell my story. I had no intentions of going further than just telling my story. <laughs> And then it just became, you know, I turned my why into how. How can I use this to benefit and to help others? So that's where I get my joy is to help others shine. You're, you're great at it, Rob. Thank you. Well, thank you. Yeah. And here I've taken your entire afternoon up. <laughs> it's okay. I, I planned for us to go to four if we needed to. So it's okay. okay. <laughs> I wasn't sure. I wasn't sure how long this would be. So yeah, I could probably talk to you until the, the cows come home, but <laughs> yeah, I just I appreciate mean, your time. I really do. Yeah. Thank you. And if you ever want me to come back on, if we want to get Ashley involved and um, Oh yeah. Th Ashley down, would love down that. The road. Yeah. We, we could do something else. Yeah. And then we could do a, a week at, we even have a Spotify channel that we put podcasts on as well. And that channel, mm -hmm. we can just talk as long as you want. Cause people are listening to their cars for long drives right. or whatever. That's, and true. that's where I listen to most of mine, <laughs> but yeah, thank you so much. I, I really appreciate you being here today and thank you, Rob. Yeah. So it, it's been a pleasure to meet you and I can't wait to have you back on. And I know Ashley is going to be so excited too because she really wanted to be here today yeah she's had to miss a few weeks but she'll be back again yeah i promise good. you guys <laughs> good now thank you rob but yeah so, so is there anything you'd like to say in closing before we head out no i i think i've i've said plenty uh so it's been great thank you rob for uh, the service you're doing to me and to other people and uh, i pray it's been a blessing for those who will listen. Thank you for joining me, Cameron. And thank you guys for watching. And we know this is a little longer than normally go, but I hope you guys will, will definitely buy Cameron's book. Um, I got mine on Amazon and Cameron, is there other places they can buy it besides Amazon? If they want to get their hands on it today, it's on Amazon. It's on Kindle. It's on Barnes and Noble. It's on a variety of places online. Excuse me, an ebook. Uh, the only place it isn't on, it's not on audiobook right now. That'll be something done hopefully before the end of the year, but probably not. Eventually it'll be done. And my publisher mentioned that as an option, but I, I wasn't I wasn't sure how to go about that. Like if I want to do the narration or if I want someone else to do it. And I think I'll have someone else do it. We'll, we'll see how that works out. That's uh, exciting. Yeah, it, the hardcover or online and the paperback. Uh, so, and the hardcover turned out really beautiful, but they're just more expensive. I've got several book signing events coming up. Uh, I've got one in Indianapolis on October 14th at the Faith and Work Forum in downtown Indianapolis. And then I've got a I've got one October. Oh yeah. I'm going back to my law school on October 20. Sorry. I'm getting it mixed up, but it's at the end of October. I think it's the 28th. It's a Tuesday and I'll be going there talking about the book and its application to the study of law. And um, yeah. So Rob, if you, if you know of anybody that, or if anybody listening wants to do a, a book signing type event, 
where I give a talk and sign books. I'm happy to do that. I enjoy doing that. And if anybody wants to me on their podcast or something like this, I, I'm thankful to be doing this too. So, yeah, thank you, Rob. Well, we have to meet up very soon because that my book seems to be missing a signature. So that's I wanna, right. I want to get that signed. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're welcome to come into my office. If anybody, if you have any local people, they can so they can get it on Amazon and stuff. But they can during during the week they can just pop in the office and buy a copy and I can sign it right here. I've got several okay. copies in the office. Yeah. So, so you're located on Pearl Street in yep, downtown in New, Al- in New Albany. Yeah, because there's a Pearl Street in Jeffersonville. It's the Pearl Street in New Albany, uh, near Elderberry, near Hem and Her, uh, right in the heart of downtown New Albany. Yeah, we pass the uh, that all the time because that's where my wife gets her elderberry syrup. <laughs> oh right, yep, yes. We the, we tag team it. I drop her off at the corner, and then I go around the the block at the bank, and I watch my watch. And as soon as I see the transaction come through, I drive <laughs> back around and pick her up. <laughs> right. <laughs> so we have like a little system work. going. Like <laughs> yeah, work. you got it. You got it down. So yeah, that's I know good. exactly where you're located. So I'll have to pop in. Yeah, for sure. Feel free yeah. to. So, guys, thank you so much for joining us today. Make sure you check out Cameron's book. Uh, if you're local, pop in. He'll be more than happy to give you a signature and um, tell him Rob sent you. <laughs> That's right. So, thanks for joining us. We'll see you guys next week. Thank you. <laughs> Bye-bye.